our dear viewers and listeners. We greet you all in the wonderful and precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the day the Lord has made. And we shall rejoice and be glad in it. As we open up today's Bible study, let's dedicate it to the Lord with a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We give you the praise, the glory, the honor, and the power, and the praise. You are here in our midst, doing what only you know how to do best, to save lives, to touch nations, to turn nations back to you, to raise people from the dust, that you cause them to sit with kings and princesses, to open our hearts, that we might receive the engrafted word which is able to save us. And so, Father, today, we are open. We are humbled by what you're doing in our midst. And we thank you, King of glory, because with you, all things are possible. With you, it is well. And so we thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. amen. And amen. Our dear viewers and listeners, last week we broke off when John, who had ceased to be an observer, had now been given a reed like rod and given specific instructions to measure a certain portion of the temple which included the altar and the people thereof, but excluding the outer court. And we saw how that fitted into the times in which we live. And we will pick it up from there, which is verse 3 of the book of Revelation chapter 11. And we shall begin from there. And this is what the Bible says. And I will give power to my two witnesses. And they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before God, the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut the heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. And they have power over the waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them and he will overcome them and he will kill them. I want to emphasize one thing. That when we talk about the book of Revelation, we are referring to the revelation of Jesus Christ. The key principle here is revealing Jesus Christ. So why the revelation of Jesus? Because there is so much going on around us which has a prime agenda and that prime agenda is to obscure to avail, to veil our 
understanding from being able to understand and perceive who Christ is. Because when we understand who Jesus Christ is as a person, we then understand what he came to accomplish on earth. And there live our lives fruitfully. But all this begins with the revelation of who Jesus is. No wonder a lot of focus has been on the things that do not matter. Living the things that matter and then our identity becomes obscured as a result. And thereby we fail to function the way we ought to function. Look at what Jesus says in the book of Acts chapter 1 from verse 6 to 8 Jesus has risen from the dead. He has spent 40 days with the disciples performing miracles before them revealing to them that he is actually the Messiah and the time has come for him to depart and at that point in time the disciples, the Bible tells us, they came to him and said, Master, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus turned to them and said, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has kept. And he tells them in verse 8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and in all the utmost parts of the earth. What is he trying to point out here? He wants them to understand that their duty is not to focus on the times and the seasons and try to interpret them. Rather, their duty is to witness to be his witnesses. The Greek word there is the word matus. And that word means is where we get the, the word matter. So our lives are to witness for Christ. Our lives are to reveal Christ. Why is that so? Because in every age and every season and time, God never leaves himself without a witness. And in today's text, we see God giving power to his witnesses that he testifies of as my witnesses. Now look at how this sinks in with what Jesus talked about. He says you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses. So like the two witnesses we see in the book of Revelation, their mandate is to Israel. In the current time that we live in, the mandate is up to us to witness for Christ. Now, what are you doing in this time and season? Are you so much focused on the establishment of the kingdom that you overlook the facts that you should be a witness where you are? Jesus yes. here then explains to John 
through the angel and said, I'm going to give power to my witnesses. Two peculiar people that we shall look at today. And their mandate is to unveil the Jews at the time the hidden lies and delusions of the Antichrist. The humanistic tendencies that will be so popular at that time. Remember, when Jesus talks about this Antichrist, he refers to him as the man of sin or the man of lawlessness. In Matthew chapter 24 and verse 15 or Mark chapter 13 and verse 14. And he, the Bible says he shall stand in the holy place like we see in Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4 or Daniel chapter 9 and he shall declare himself to be God. No wonder when God is measuring out this premise for the temple he leaves out the outer court because it is from this place that the Antichrist will move to occupy the holy place. This is what the Bible calls the abomination that causes desolation. Now, when the Antichrist takes his place in the temple of God and pronounces himself as God. That is the highest level of abomination that can happen. And taking it back to what is happening now. The reason God raises these two witnesses is to reveal to humanity that whatever the Antichrist is teaching at that moment is false and is not in sync with what God has revealed. Now back to these two witnesses. There is so much that has gone on that we spend a lot of time trying to identify who they are. I will reveal to you several theories that have come forward. Some people believe that these two are not people but rather they are movements or powers within religious organizations but this is against the very word that is used here God calls them my witnesses now the use of the word pronoun or the pronoun my means ownership. In others, he's saying, I own them, they are mine. Second, he talk calls for a relationship. And third, it calls for a fellowship. Now, ownership, relationship, and fellowship cannot be for organizations. They are for specific persons. Secondly, the word witness, like I explained earlier, comes from a Greek word matos, where we get the word matter. Now, an organization cannot be a matter. It is persons that become matters. Thirdly, every time the word witness has been used in the New Testament, 
It is with reference to persons. Now there is another attempt to try and identify who these are. There is a school of thought that says this is Elijah and Enoch. Why? Because the two persons recorded in the Bible who never physically died. So this assumption holds that they will have to come again, live physically, so that they are able to die and then go to heaven. The Bible does not describe that. There is this third school of thought which says that this is Elijah and Moses. Why Elijah and Moses? Because in Matthew, on the Mount of Transfiguration, these are the two that appeared with Jesus. Second, when you look at the power that is given to these witnesses, when they speak and fire comes out of their mouth, and if you read the account of Elijah, in the book of 1 Kings, there was a time when the king sent soldiers to him. And the first team of the captain with these 50 men in chapter 1 and verse 10 when they came to him, Elijah called fire on them. And the king sent another team of 50 soldiers with their captain. And he called fire on them also. So because fire still comes when these men speak, they've interpreted one to be Elijah. And then the second one to be Moses because when he speaks, Moses did not just speak, Moses performed miracles. And among the miracles Moses performed was to turn the river Nile to blood. And these witnesses will have that capacity to do so. Number three, Elijah prayed and there was no rain for three and a half years. And then he prayed again and it rained. So they correlate all this and come to the assumption that these two are Elijah and Moses. Now there is another extreme school of thought which says no, these are Joshua and Zerubbabel from the book of Zechariah chapter 4. And how do they derive that? Because the text tells us in verse 4 that these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. When you read Zechariah chapter 4, you will see the character of the two olive oils and the two lampstands. And it is from here that God declares the very famous verse that we love to quote. Not by might, nor by power, but my spirit, says the Lord. Now, what is our stand on this? What is our take on this? We don't believe that these are actually the persons of Elijah 
Moses, Enoch, and so on. We believe that these will be people that God will raise in that time that we come in the spirit and the character and the power of Elijah, Moses, Zerubbabel, and Joshua. And the text tells us because it does not reveal their names. Therefore, we cannot speculate. We need to leave it at that. God will raise men in that time for this specific purpose. But why in the spirit of these men. And the purpose is because he's addressing the nation of Israel. He is speaking to them and they have a perfect understanding of who Moses was and how he turned the river Nile to blood. They do have an understanding of who Elijah was and how he called fire down on the people. They have an understanding of who Zerubbabel was and Joshua and Joshua how they rebuilt the temple out of the ruins. So this speaks to the situation that we are talking about right now. And what their mandate on earth is. So where does that all fit into us today? So rather than focus on these people, God wants us to see a mirror of what their mandate is and what our mandate is right now. These were two men or oh, these will be two men that will have a far-reaching prophetic impact upon the nation of Israel. Now, how about the thousands today that have been graciously saved by the Lord Jesus Christ? What is it that you are doing to witness about Christ and his grace. To witness about Christ and his finished work. That should be a call to us that currently we are the witnesses. We are the people Jesus Christ is calling my witnesses with the mandate to carry this gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth with a mandate to witness for Christ in season and out of season. It is us, the children of God, who have been saved by grace that need to step out and reach the broken, sinful, hurting world with the healing message of Jesus Christ. As children of God, the reason we are empowered with the Holy Spirit is that we witness the Holy Spirit comes in our lives to illuminate our lives so that we become the light in the darkness. No wonder Jesus puts it this way in Matthew chapter 5. When he speaks to his disciples, he tells them, you are the light of the world. Not you will be the light. Right now, you are the light of the world. And a city built cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp 
and puts it under a bush. But it is put on the lampstand that it may give light to And Jesus winds it up and says, so let your light shine before me. That they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. What is that to do? with us. If our actions, if our lives does not bring glory to God, then we are not witnessing effectively for Christ. It is the same thing Paul writes to the church in Corinthians. And he tells them, you are not your own. You are bought with a price. Therefore, for glorify your Father, glorify God with your bodies. So your bodies are meant to give glory to God and not for any other function. So our lives should be witnessing for Christ. And what we pick from this scripture are some very wonderful truths. Number one, that God has provided all the resources that you need to accomplish what he wants you to accomplish on earth. He will provide the protection. He will give you the grace and the anointing so that you are able to bring forth an authoritative and indisputable testimony. You see, concerning these witnesses, the Bible tells us in verse 7 that when they had completed their testimony, then that is when the Antichrist, that is when the beast comes to torment them. Before completing their testimony, no weapon formed against them prospered. And that is the same thing with us, saints of God. You see, whatever the enemy will raise up against you, if you are an effective witness for Christ, will not have power over you until you have completed the testimony for which God has placed you on this earth. Let me put it this way that your life and my life is a testimony of God's grace is a testimony of God's faithfulness is a testimony of God's love is a testimony of God's power and that is why Christ came that's why he said the thief cometh not but to kill to steal and to destroy but I am come that they may have life and have it more abundant. I don't want you to lose focus on this. Otherwise, we get swamped up with the minorities and fail to focus on what is really important. Look at what Jesus shows us. And the consequence of this is grave. Because at the end of the day, we don't become fruitful in our season. And our lives become the, like the life of the fig tree that Jesus talks about in Mark 11. The Bible says as Jesus was walking to Jerusalem, he was hungry. 
And in a distance he sees a fig tree which had a lot of leaves. So he approaches the tree and he finds no fruit on it. It's its appearance was an appearance of fruitfulness. But it had no fruit. And as a result of that, he said, let no man eat of your fruit. And the tree withered. Now this seems very not in sync with who Jesus is or as we know him as a person. But there is a very important lesson for us. You see, it's not about us saying, I'm a child of God, I'm a child of God, I'm a child of God. We have to come to a level where we don't gossip about God. No. We are his witnesses. His witnesses. A witness does not gossip about the one he's witnessing about. A witness speaks from a, a point of relationship. He speaks from a point of ownership. He speaks from a point of fellowship. When you are talking about Jesus, or when you are talking about God, are you speaking from a point of ownership? That when we are talking about God, we are speaking, my father said this. When it comes to a point of prayer. You are in a moment of fellowship with your father. It is so precious a moment for you that you cannot lay back in your bed with your head covered and there is a father in heaven. Ah. It is so precious a moment for you. This is the fellowship that you desire. This is the relationship that you live and breathe. And consequently, your life is to witness to this God. Does that define you? Or is there something missing? You see, to call yourself a child of God is one thing. To be called a child of God by those who watch you is another thing altogether. Today, we have so many people calling themselves children of God. But when people look at your life. But when others watch the life that you live, can they testify that you are a witness to the fact that you are a child of the Most High God? This is what it is all about, brethren. That's what the scripture says to us in Mark chapter 16. That they went forth. The Lord working with them. Confirming his word. With miracles and signs following. That accompanies a fellowship. Their lives were witnessing of what Christ had done in them. And he was now working through them. 
which brings us to where we began. Unless we have the big picture of the grand agenda of God, I would liken it to two equipment. One is a telescope. And the other is a microscope. You see, a telescope is used in outer space with the objective of finding objects that are not conceivable to our natural eyes and bring clarity and reveal them for what they really are to us. So on the other hand, a microscope looks at tiny things and then amplifies them. It makes them so big beyond what they really are. Now let me drive the point home. Unless our revelation, unless the objective of our lives is to reveal Christ for who he is, when we, when we reveal Christ for who he is, then our lives become telescopic. If we fail to do that, then we are going to focus on the things that don't matter. And our lives then become microscopic. We look at small things with the intention of magnifying them. So my brother and sister, you have a choice to make. As you witness for Christ. Will it be Christ? Or will it be something or somebody else? Will you choose your life to be telescopic? Finding the big grand thing the grand thing who is Jesus Christ and let your life reveal him for who he is or will you go around looking for the small things of life and try to magnify them that is the question I leave with you remember you are called to be a witness. That is your mandate. Until Jesus comes back. Now for you who has never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You can't effectively witness for him. This is your moment. Join me with prayer as you surrender your heart to Christ that he become the savior and lord of your life pray with me father lord I am a sinner I need a savior in my life and the bible testifies that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ today I believe that Jesus Christ, you are the Son of God. You are my Savior, you are my Redeemer, you are my treasure, you are my King. Come into my life. Save it. For all eternity. Thank you, Lord, for saving you. Amen. Now let me pray with you. Father of glory, your word declares that those that come to you, you will no wise cast out. Therefore, Lord, I pray for that one that has believed on you as Savior and Lord of their lives. Stretch forth your hand, dear Lord. Receive them into your kingdom. 
I pray, Lord, that you place that seal of the Holy Spirit upon their lives. Fill them with your spirit. Fill their souls, fill their lives with that joy of gladness. With, with that sense of purpose. For that one who was at the end of his life. Lord, I thank you. Because right now you're stretching your hand and snatching him from the jaws of death. Father, I pray that you strengthen them, that you guide them, that you lead them, that you preserve them, and you prevail upon them. The very purpose for which they were created. That they may fulfill your purposes and be a testimony on this earth to the glory and honor and the praise of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now for you who has made this prayer, Jesus has come into your life and your life will never be the same. Why? Because the Bible says that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone. Behold, all things have become new. You are the new creature in Christ Jesus. His spirit is reigning in you. And you on your way to witness for him. To this dark world. Don't forget to call the number on your screen to testify of what God has done or what God is doing in your life through this Bible study. Otherwise, let's meet again next Tuesday. God richly bless you. Shalom. Shalom.